Hi, this is Dr. A, and this is your clinical chemistry re review video on myoglobin, troponin, and BNP. All right, so let's start with myoglobin. So it's essentially a single chain of hemoglobin. It is similar to hemoglobin. It has a heme group and a combined oxygen, uh, but it is found in muscles, whereas hemoglobin is found in red blood cells. So um, myoglobin being found in muscle is released into the blood after muscle tissue is damaged. Large amounts are released after crushing injuries that occur during a trauma. So think car wreck or big fall um, and in any skeletal muscle diseases and also in rhabdomyolysis. So skeletal muscle disease like Duchenne's muscular dystrophy and something like that. So something that's causing the destruction of skeletal muscle. You will see a lot of myoglobin released in um, in the blood and it's a concern because myoglobin is extremely toxic to the kidneys and it can lead to renal failure so renal failure can be a complication of rhabdomyolysis if the damage is extensive so um it is released when muscle is damaged but it is non-specific so we'll not tell you what muscle it came from it's just that there's a muscle that's being damaged so um uh, it's usefulness sometimes it's actually in its absence because then it could rule out an acute MI, a myocardial infarction. Uh, but it, of course, it also, uh, if you're looking, if you're suspecting rhabdomyolysis or uh, Shane's muscular dystrophy or something like that, then it would be it being increased and could um, correlate to like how much damage is going on. Uh, for the heart, it also rises earlier than troponin or CKMB. So CKMB is in the enzyme videos and troponin. I'm going to talk about it here in just a minute. Uh, because it rises early and then it's quickly cleared, it can also be used to measure the success of reperfusion. So like an intervention such as the cath lab, putting stents uh, or doing balloon procedures and stuff like that in the coronary arteries. So um, that that can be useful whereas you'll see with troponin troponin uh it takes a little bit longer to rise but it stays elevated for a long time so um yeah for, for that model woman is still useful which is why it is still done um it's because it, one it shows up first two it's quickly cleared so then if there's another damage or uh the reperfusion failed and stuff like that then you if you test the myoglobin you should see a change in it also pretty quickly the uh, analysis of myoglobin is done by nephilometry turbidimetry immunofluorescence and latex agglutination all right so let's talk about troponins then so uh troponins there are actually there are they're found in all muscle tissue but um they have been become markers of cardiac damage so the cardiac troponins are really the gold standard the, the markers of choice for people with acute coronary syndrome really meaning to help detect a heart attack so the cardiac troponin is a protein complex that's located along the thin filament of myofibrils, which are inside muscle cells. And myofibrils, they and with along with the troponins and stuff, they help regulate the contraction of cardiac muscle. Calcium binds the troponin to initiate the contraction of the muscle. So that gives you an idea of its role in physiology. And it, now again, it is present in other troponin. The molecule of troponin is present in other. Uh, muscle all the skeletal muscle and all that it's just like the, we can differentiate it between the regular muscle one and the cardiac one because it's slightly different so up to 80 percent of patients with an acute mi so a heart attack will have an elevated troponin level within two to three hours of emergency department arrival versus six to nine hours or more with ckmb so uh, of all cardiac markers troponin cardiac troponin is the most specific and sensitive for a heart attack uh, troponin T and troponin I of both cardiac markers, cardiac troponins, um, they can either, either one can be done. However, troponin I uh, is used more frequently than troponin T. Your um, cardiac troponins then are the gold standards for the diagnosis of acute coronary syndrome or myocarditis, which would be an infection of the heart muscle. The, and again, acute coronary syndrome, meaning a heart attack. The levels rise again within two to three hours of onset. They peak at 12 to 24 hours and they remain elevated for one to three weeks, um, which is also good because um, it can, you know, it can detect it even if it happened a day or two ago. The analysis is usually via ELISA or immunoenzymatic, immunometric assay. Um, there's also some immunocumuluminescent assays out there uh, in low side technology. 
All right, so this gives you, this is kind of gives you an idea. This is for the, the different heart markers. They used to use ALT, LDH, and all that. But the ones we're really we're interested in are myoglobin and then CKB, which is in a different video, and troponin and troponin T. So then again, it shows you uh, when the infarction happens in, in days, myoglobin basically peaks, and it's going to be cleared almost within 24 hours, whereas your cardiac troponins a little bit slower to rise, and they'll peak at that 12 to 24 hour key here and there and then they'll slowly go down but they'll, they'll still be slightly elevated for weeks on the end okay and another protein marker um, that is cardiac related is BNP and N-terminal pro-BNP so uh, BNP stands for brain type natriuretic peptide uh, it is one of three natriuretic peptide there's AMP and CNP also in a function of these natriuretic peptides is to regulate blood pressure. So natrium and Na, Na is sodium. So um, they mess and actually what they do is they help you, they, you dump sodium so that you dump fluid so that you can lower the blood pressure. Um, and um, so it does regulate blood pressure, electrolyte balance, sodium, right? And obviously they're with all of it fluid volume. So they're considered neural hormones. Um, and BNP is produced primarily by the ventricle and produced to pressure and stretch. So if you have a lot of blood, uh, because you have a lot of fluid and high blood pressure coming in, your, uh, your ventricle, especially your left ventricle, is going to be stretched in response to that increased volume. And then that will uh, cause a release of BNP to dump some of that volume some of that fluid um, so it does function to con con counteract the vasoconstrictive effects of the hormones of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system or ras system so there are uh, opposite effect so the renin angiotensin aldosterone system usually kicks in when you have um, you're dehydrated, have low blood pressure or whatever to increase volume, whereas the natriuretic peptides kick in when you have too much volume to lower it. Um, and so, um, yeah, the RAS increases blood pressure and it causes you to retain salt and water, whereas the natriuretic pe peptides will uh, decrease blood pressure and dump fluids and dump sodium. The pro-BNP-108 is a molecule that is stored in the myocytes of that left ventricle, and then when it is released due to stretch, it is cleaved into N-terminal pro-BNP and BNP. Both of those can be analyzed. So um, BNP and NT-pro-BNP are both markers for congestive heart failure. So there's where their value is, is these guys will be elevated in patients that have congestive heart failure. BNP assays are available on many immunoassay analyzers. Once drawn, the specimen has to be separated from the cells within four hours in the plasma refrigerated. Some of the uh, there's cartridges of these uh, BNP tests are, they can be done using whole blood, but you need, you want to run it really quick. You don't want to sit on it for a long time. The assays are radio immunodiffusion and a microparticle enzyme immunoassay and electrochemiluminescence immunoassays. Those are what is used to assess these uh, again you can see really high elevations like in the tens of thousands and stuff with extensive congestive heart failure but uh, generally speaking anything i believe a cutoff of about 100 uh, is considered uh, diagnostic for congestive heart failure all right and that is uh, your last slide for these three proteins thank you for your attention